We're back, and I'm always delighted to say we are joined by one of our regulars on the financial and economic beat. His name is Bill Walton. We're going to talk with him today about a variety of subjects uh, that are top of mind at the moment because of, well, a meeting happened last week and the meetings that are taking place this week. At uh, the multilateral level, as they say, uh, Bill brings a background in the financial sector as a, a CEO of Allied Capital. He has been a leader in the conservative movement since he came to Washington, uh, notably at the Council for National Policy, which I'm very proud to be a member. And he is these days the host of a terrific television podcast program, The Bill Walton Show. And we're always delighted to have him with us to catch up. Bill, welcome. Frank, as always, great talking with you. So uh, last week, we had the so-called BRICS meeting, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, and South Africa. Uh, They came together, and one of the things that they really wanted to get movement on was this idea of replacing the dollar as the reserve currency of the world with a basket of their currencies that uh, would, I guess, be somehow uh, blessed by the International Monetary Fund and special drawing rights and so on. What's going on here, Bill? Is this a real threat to the reserve status of the dollar? And if so, how soon? Short answer is no. Long answer is it's complicated. I mean, to back up a bit, the dollar, the reserve currency is essentially what happened when the U.S. dollar replaced gold as the asset which foreign banks and and other entities wanted to hold as a reserve against you know their their assets. And mm-hmm. at one point, it was about eighty five percent U.S. denominated treasuries, U.S. bonds, uh, more recently mortgage backed securities. That was in nineteen seventy seven. It's now fallen to about 58% of the world's total now. And by comparison, the euro is at about 20%. And those relationships have stayed pretty stable for the last uh, uh, last 20 years. And uh, what you're seeing is some uptick in some currencies. One would expect the, the Chinese yuan or remindi to, remindi to, be, to pick up. But what's happening is China is not going to achieve that status so long as people don't trust the Chinese central bank and in particular the Chinese Communist Party. So it's resting. And there's a lot of reason not to do that. Well, yeah, we've discussed that before. There's (laughs) that's a rational that's a rational response to uh, to the environment. (laughs) But Bill, one of the things that the Chinese and the Russians are trying to do, because they both have got uh, you know restrictions on their currencies uh, convertibility is to put them into this so-called basket uh, and have other currencies that can be used to um, you know, somehow homogenize uh, theirs and uh, make this a, a viable alternative to the dollar. You're not buying it. Well, they can do it, but it's not really, you know, the, the, the reality of this is the money moves really in proportion to the size of, of global economies. And so we're you know, and, and population. I mean, we're about 350 million people. EU is about the same. Our economy is the largest in the world. EU is, is I think, third after Russia. And so the, the money is going to move in proportion to the size of the economies. And so if you look at the, the countries inside BRIC, they're a tiny proportion. And even though China technically might be part of that, as we've talked about, the trust factor is, is, is zero there. Yeah. Um, and it's only got worse in the last year or two as we've watched them crush uh, crush equities in China. So, right. but the, but <clears> the among thing, other things, the thing to Hong keep Kong. in mind is that reserve currency doesn't mean a stable currency. It doesn't mean a strong currency. Mm. Uh, the U.S. has been ranked about tenth in the world among currencies, ranking mm. behind chi- ranking behind uh, the euro, the pound, and I think I think Kuwait is considered to have a stronger currency. Wow. I may have that country wrong, but it's a Middle Eastern country that's stronger yeah. than the dollar. So yeah. we're, we're, we're messing it up, but I don't think reserve currency is going to be the place where we see uh, the, the catastrophe. Well, from your lips to God's ears, because it, it will be a serious problem if it uh, it goes away, because, you know, printing money is what we've been doing, basically, to uh, to float our boat. And if it's not universally accepted. Uh, that well, well, this is this is fun. this is putting a gun to our own head, Frank. Inflation, yeah. the, the, the amazing uh, 
and so destructive inflation we're seeing now is mainly affecting U.S. consumers, U.S. citizens. And so mm-hmm. it doesn't affect people offshore as much as nearly as much as it affects us. Bill, let me come back to China. Um, you mentioned that we have been watching the Chinese cratering uh, equities and making them more problematic as an investment play. Um, And yet, uh, Tony Blinken has just put in charge of the foreign policy advisory board of the State Department, a guy who has been championing the idea, along with his boss, Larry Fink, of trebling our investments in China. This would be Tom Donilon, former national security advisor to Barack Obama, uh, now the chairman of the Black Rock uh, Investment Institute. Uh, what are we to make of the idea that uh, we not only have Donilon taking on a key job at state, we have the deputy secretary of the treasury, a fellow by the name of Wally Adeyamo, and the director of the National Economic Council, Brian Dees, all alumni of this uh, behemoth, uh, BlackRock, that is determined, uh, as is its boss, Larry Fink, to continue to pour American investments, including, by the way, the thrift savings plan of the federal government, into Chinese Communist Party companies, some of which are directly involved in building weapons designed to kill us. Well, there's a saying in Washington, we've talked about it, that personnel is policy. Mm -hmm. And this is exhibit A. I mean, uh, BlackRock is flooding the zone in Washington with its people and Mm -hmm. Biden's eagerly bringing them in. Donlin is just the latest, but he's 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 a pretty egregious choice. He has very little background in, in, in the job he's doing, except to act as a as an advisor to Obama and, and every major Democrat president, um, I think starting with, uh, I think he went all the way back to Carter. Carter, yes, indeed. Um, and 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 this this uh, this this panel he's on is a very big deal because they. Uh, uh, let me just read this here. Its meetings are closed to the public due to discussions on sensitive and often classified topics and materials concerning China, mm-hmm. and. You know, BlackRock, as we know, is all in on China. Even not Big even time. seeing what's been happening the last couple of years, they're still all in. Yeah. Um, and I think Donlin may have been may have been one of the BlackRock advisors that recommended that people triple their investments in China. Yeah, he was, well, he had was that indeed. happened, you would have been uh, you would have been a lot of, a lot of pain right now. Yeah. But he, he's also added Chris Dodd to the list, and Chris Dodd we know is 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 notorious for. Uh, representing foreign governments and i'm sure china's on his in his client hollywood, list hollywood yeah, yeah, and it's you know we've got dominant nig we, who's uh who's uh, going to represent us in the asia pacific economic cooperation business advisory council and and mm-hmm. on record here is saying we've been way too tough towards china and we ought to we ought to work toward rapprochement with china yeah. and of course that means giving in now it does submission but, but let's 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 strategically look where we are with china the United States had record imports of manufacturing goods last year, almost $1.7 trillion. And five, almost five, half of that, half a trillion dollars was from China. And that doesn't include the exports or the imports we've taken in from Vietnam, which essentially China uses to launder some of its exports. And so we're, we're vastly still dependent on China for manufacturing goods. And that's at a record level. Yeah. Uh, not Even though Trump was on was out there saying we ought to reduce our dependence on China. That increased virtually every year through the Trump administration Mm -hmm. and has just grown dramatically in the last year. And it would presumably even more so if those tariffs that Trump imposed are pulled off uh, piecemeal, if not on block. Which Janet Yellen's all for, by the way. Which she is all for. Oh, yeah, she's all for getting rid of Um, the tariffs. Let let me just uh, mention that, that one of the manufactured substances that we are importing in large quantities from China, especially uh, as the tariffs come off them, are solar panels. Uh, There's a report that uh, some of the Chinese solar panels are uh, being recalled because they have a small defect 
They blow up, <laughs> for heaven's <laughs> sakes. If ever there were a good reason for uh, wanting to you know, diversify sources of supply and manufacture here, uh, this is a case in point. But Bill, we're almost out of time, and I did want to ask you about the meeting that's taking place this week, the G7 meeting. One of the things on its agenda is a um, competitive alternative, they say, to China's very far advanced Belt and Road Initiative. It's called the Partnership for Global Investment, Infrastructure and Investment, PGII. Um, what are we to make of this idea? Uh, is it real? Is it going to be genuinely an alternative, do you think, for the world's uh, investment and in infrastructure? Well, uh, let me just back up to say what I think about the G7. G7 is meeting again at a, at a very posh place in, in, in Germany, south of Munich, five-star hotel. Always does. And the leaders of these countries are not serious people. At least they're not serious in terms of the well-being of, of, of the world and their own, uh, their own voters. The, you know, they're there to talk about climate they're okay. there talking about what to do about t- pandemics past and, and they hope for a future so they can lock people down. And equity, too. And Don't equity, diversity, equity, equity yeah. and inclusion is all part of this agenda. And, right. and China, with the Belt and Road, has very cleverly slid itself into the social good category where they say, well, we're investing to help to help uh, countries and economies and people around the world. Infrastructure, well, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Well, I, <clears throat> Bill, we are out of time, I'm afraid, but uh, we're going to come back to this issue because it's not going to go away. Um, are we going to be competitive around the world with China or not? Thanks for your time, my friend, and the great work you do at the Bill Walton Show. Come back to us next week, if you would. Right. Chuck DeVore is up next. We'll talk with him about border insecurity and more right after this. 